Good morning, everyone. I'm, I'm Doug Richardson of the Association of American Geographers. Uh, we are so pleased and proud to have with us um, on this panel uh, some of the most distinguished people uh, around the world working on the question of human rights. And uh, for me, it's, a, it's an enormous uh, pleasure to share this panel with, with um, such distinguished people. I want to take a few minutes before we begin and just address a question that is a, probably in the minds of many people. Um, why geography and human rights, or for that matter, more broadly, why science and human rights? What role do academic associations play in human rights? And why aren't we playing a larger role? Might be a question to be asked as well. Um, I'd just like to, to begin with a broader question, human rights and scientific associations. Um, about four years ago, um, I helped to begin an organization at the AAAS, along with Jessica Windham and others, um, that uh, was called the uh, Science and Human Rights Coalition. What's interesting about this is that um, nearly 50 uh, academic associations, mostly in the social sciences and the physical sciences, um, have come together to examine uh, what role does human rights play within our own disciplines, within our own work, and how can our disciplines, how can our sciences, uh, how can our humanities, and how can our social sciences uh, contribute to um, understanding human rights abuses, to uh, verifying them, to uh, preventing them from occurring, uh, and how can we support human rights organizations such as Amnesty International and others in their work by using our science? This, uh, these 50 associations range from uh, uh, biology, chemistry, engineering to anthropology, sociology, political science. Of course, geography has played a, a leading role in this as well. Um, well. One of my goals and one of the goals that I think uh, makes sense is uh, to try to mainstream human rights within geography, to try to mainstream human rights within the Association of American Geographers. And as those of you know who have been uh, coming to our meetings for a while, we've had very high profile focus on human rights in geography and human rights and geography. Um, both how can we um, examine the role of human rights in the work that we do as uh, geographers. And I would, I would suggest that human rights are are integral to the practice of geography as it is to the practice of most uh, sciences. Um, we're trying to raise the profile of human rights. We're trying to develop a, a AG human rights clearinghouse. We have lots of uh, resource materials. Uh, we're also doing research and other projects to address those abuses. Very quickly, uh, you can see the prominence we give to human rights in these kinds of areas. Uh, we work closely with a number of other associations uh, and also the AAAS. Um, we have developed a, a very substantial project and uh, uh, AG Geography and Human Rights Resources as part of a clearinghouse. That includes bibliographic databases. Um, it includes a forum for scholars to network and discuss research topics around uh, human rights. It also um, involves um, the linkage of human rights uh, organizations. So we have ways for different organizations to come together uh, discuss uh, human rights issues, uh, emergencies, and other events, um, and this is accessible to everyone. Uh, the bibliography is designed um, to help uh, provide information about geographers doing ethnographic research, field work, regional studies, etc., where we are on the ground all around the world, and we can help to be among the first to help identify and bring to the attention of human rights organizations and to the world human rights abuses that we encounter in our, in our field work uh, uh, nearly everywhere around the world. Uh, in addition, we have um, uh, other resources for identifying uh, uh, within this database um, for monitor monitoring, verifying, and, and um, addressing human rights abuses. Finally, uh, these, this bibliography um, offers a rich source of expertise to those who are seeking expert witnesses and uh, are involved in human rights tribunals. Um, we also um, integrate human rights directly into our statements of professional ethics. This is a, something that's becoming uh, more common. To use human rights as, as one of the foundations for uh, trying to address ethics within 
uh, our discipline and to address the way in which we do our, do our work on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, these include uh, explicit uh, references to human rights throughout our ethics statements. Um, some of the sample topics uh, in our ethics that are covered uh, include relationships with people, places, and things. Uh, we're one of the ones who are, who are looking at the human rights of the next generation. In other words, what kind of world do we leave uh, people in the next generation and how will that affect their, their human rights? Um, many other areas from uh, research involving ge geospatial technologies to research involving indigenous peoples, ethnic minorities, and other potentially vulnerable groups. Uh, we do uh, funded work uh, on ethics in the NSF funded projects on ethics and GIS. Um, we have an ethics, justice, and human rights specialty group. Uh, we're engaged in supporting a lot of programs and working together with uh, AAAS and others um, uh, on human rights abuses work. I'm just going to flip very quickly through some samples of uh, uh, sort of the type of imagery and so forth that can be in mapping work that, that can address human rights abuses. At the most basic level, uh, this map, uh, satellite imagery, shows uh, the uh, Kibera slum in Nairobi. And you can clearly see spatially uh, the distribution of, of, of access to housing, adequate housing. This is the large slum. Next to it is the golf course and the much more affluent areas next door. It's a very uh, stunning, very quick view of, of this sort of thing. The next, um, one of the areas that we've been working in together with AAAS and have been back and forth with their staff, although they're taking the lead on it, is looking at uh, the use of imagery. Some of that imagery departed, provided by the Department of State in Darfur region. And you can see these two villages, uh, the one in October 2006, and the other in uh, 2000, January of 2007, just a few months later after attacks by uh, Janjaweed uh, rebels. And this is the sort of verification that we can do very quickly. Not only are we trying to verify these human rights abuses, because what always happens when there's human rights abuse, everybody denies it, right? So how can we document that? This is very clear, quick documentation. Furthermore, with some villages that we know have been threatened, we are actually uh, notifying uh, those who uh, have threatened to um, just come into these villages uh, with the fact that they we're monitoring them. So we're also trying to prevent uh, by monitoring and letting those um, who would attack these villages know that, that the world is watching and that uh, if they do this, we're going to see it happening in real time, near real time, and be able to perhaps respond. And that, that uh, evidence suggests that that's been pretty successful in some regards. Uh, very quickly, uh, many other areas. This is uh, the Gambela region of western Ethiopia, and this shows uh, evidence of rural displacement, displacement and villagization. Villagization is sort of a small-scale form of urbanization, moving people off the land into areas that then open up those areas as cleared blocks of land that can be used by, um, for large um, agribusiness agri types of applications. Um, mass grave sites in Kosovo. There's been a lot of work done by geographers in this area, uh, including geographers at the Department of State. And this is uh, a map developed of mass grave sites throughout, uh, uh, throughout the area. Uh, this is the kind of imagery used to identify them. You can see uh, July 5th, 95, July 27th, 95. What's different? These are the recently disturbed areas that represent, uh, that turned out to be mass grave sites. Um, and then if you go on to look at damaged buildings, uh, is in addition to uh, mass grave sites, you can see uh, the, bell the, the areas in red represent uh, areas in which uh, 75 to 100% of the buildings have been damaged. Um, there's a picture of one here. We helped to use the combination of imagery and mapping to identify this kind of uh, information. This kind of imagery shows you the burned houses. Uh, in Sri Lanka, another quick example. Uh, these are safe areas. Uh, in the Sri Lanka area uh, prior to January 2009 when, as you know, um, the, uh, there was a massive displacement of people. Um, and this, um, this shows that the effects of shelling over time on the mass movement of civilians uh, south pushed from this uh, area January 1st, February, May. And the safe area was here, then it was moved over down to here. Finally, it was all of these people were moved into this little area down here. So you can see, keep this area in mind right here. This is a, um, then shows you a beach, nearly empty beach, 
um, the safe zone in Sri Lanka at the heart of the conflict between the Tamil Tigers and the Sri Lankan forces. And if you look at the second photo, this is February 09, this is April 09. This is practically an empty beach in that little third area I mentioned. And now there are uh, 100,000 displaced people and 25,000 tents. You can quickly assess that. And uh, as you see, they're all down in this little area here. And then you can actually determine how the shelling forced these people down. This is a little difficult to see, but these are the, sh the shelling activities that took place over a sequential period of time based on the cratering, and you can determine where these shells came from. So here, starting at the very beginning of that period of time, uh, it moves oops, quickly. Um, this, uh, this animation has actually already occurred. So here's the beginning of it, and then it moves on in an animated form to show the sequential fund shelling and that shelling basically continued to push people from the original safe area down through here down through here and finally concentrated them on this beach here so uh, those are a few examples of, of ways in which geography and geographers interact with human rights and uh, we continue to do that at our annual meetings including uh, many previous ones and some outstanding events at this meeting including uh, the at presentation of the ag atlas award to mary robinson outstanding opening plenaries and then the session we have now. So with that, uh, I'd like to have Audrey introduce Nicholas Kristof. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Doug. I think you've really shown us the, the power of some of our analytical tools, uh, but also those are reflective of the very deep commitment to human rights that has been part of this uh, discipline and the association for a very long time. Uh, and I'm just delighted to see so many people here today for this exciting session. When it was announced that uh, Nicholas Kristof was going to speak at the AAG, I had nothing but positive remarks and people saying, oh, they were just so delighted to hear uh, that he would be here because uh, Nicholas Kristof is someone who uh, is a geographer, uh, certainly at heart. Uh, he uh, grew up in a geographical household. His, his father, Lattice, was a political tra scientist by training and a geographer by love, as Nick said to me uh, before the session started. And I know that there are people in the room and several people throughout the meeting who have come up to tell me uh, that they knew his father, who was a regular attendee at um, the AAG. Nicholas Kristof has traveled and written about more countries than any geographer could possibly dream. Someone asked me earlier, do you think he really goes to all those countries? <laughs> and, 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 and I think we can be sure that he has. He is a two-time Pulitzer Prize winner, widely known for coverage in all parts of the world, but uh, in particular in, in, in China uh, and uh, more recently in, in various parts of Africa, in particular the Sudan. I am struck when I read his work uh, by his ability to focus on the life of an individual. And as geographers, we often worry about the geography of the household and, and recognize that social justice and human rights begin in the household, often in intimate relationships. Uh, but, but he's never just telling the story about an individual. He is always positioning that individual in a context, in a, indeed a geographical context, uh, that includes the community, that includes the nation, and that includes the entire planet in terms of the scope and the severity of many of the issues that he deals with. I am also impressed by the fact that, uh, I, hope, I hope I'm not speaking for you, but from reading his, comments, his columns, it's very clear that questions of human rights and social justice uh, are not just somewhere else uh, in the world, but also include uh, issues at home. And he, he writes very eloquently also about questions in the United States. So I'm going to stop talking <laughs> uh, because I know that you're all very anxious to hear Nicholas Kristof. Thanks very much, and 
I do actually go to all these places, but you know, after admiring that nifty satellite technology, I'm kind of thinking that maybe I can save a lot on travel costs. Um, <laughs> I'm going to have to look into that. Um, the AAG was indeed a, a very important part of my dad's life. He was very proud of having been a 50-year member. Uh, he uh, always tried our family's patience by going to every geographic conference anywhere in the world at the drop of a hat. Um, and um, for those of you who, who know him, you also know that for him, geography wasn't just a, a discipline. It was very much um, his life and the world that he had grown up in. And as a consequence, kind of the world that I grew up in. As a child, I was always a little puzzled that everybody else had an answer to the question of where are you from. And with my dad, it was always a lot more complicated. Uh, <laughs> he, um, in fact, my dad, when Push tended to identify himself as uh, of Romanian origin, um, his sister would describe herself as Armenian and his brother as Polish. And there they, you know, they'd all grown up in the same household. Uh, when my aunt called, my dad would speak to her in Romanian. When my uncle called, my dad would speak to him in Polish. And this was really <laughs> hard for a, a, you know, a kid to understand, uh, especially maybe a kid growing up in, in the U.S. But um, indeed, the reality was they had been a, uh, a family of, uh, originally of Armenian origin, had been Polonized. Uh, when my dad was born at the end of 1918, the area was still Austria-Hungary. Then a few months later, with the Treaty of Versailles, it became Romania. Um, it, um, uh, then it, today, it's part of the Ukraine. Um, and, uh, and they were, um, they themselves uh, tended to speak Polish in the household, although they made sure they got their French and German newspapers on the doorstep each day, which <laughs> is also something that would be hard to imagine uh, today. Um, my dad also very much encouraged me to travel. Um, I remember at the, when I was in, um, uh, actually in graduate school, at the end of 1981, I was in Poland at the time that martial law was declared. Well, you may remember Jaruzelski imposed martial law and uh, all communications were cut off, but I was able to file some stories out uh, to the Washington Post. And so a Portland TV station came out and wanted to interview my parents, and clearly their narrative was local couple in jitters over sun caught in war-torn Poland. And so the cameraman you know, interviewed my dad and said, well, it must be terribly alarming to have your son stuck in Poland. It's, oh, no, it's such a great opportunity for him. <laughs> and, you know, the, 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 the journalist kept on pushing him. Oh, but, you know, you have no news from him. Things might go wrong. And, oh, but he's a journalist. I'm sure he's delighted to be here. It was clearly a, a vast miscommunication. <laughs> um, I think people are often surprised that I use my... Um, New York Times op-ed column, uh, which kind of is the, the priciest real estate in, in, in journalism, um, so often for these sort of international human rights issues. And in part, really, that goes back to uh, something that I learned after I got the column. Originally, when I got it, I thought, okay, I'll be writing about things, and you know, twice a week, I'll be, I'll be shaping people's minds on important issues. <laughs> Boy, <laughs> it doesn't work that way, I got to tell you. You know, if I write about the issues of the day, if I write about the presidential election, Obama versus Republicans, gun control, uh, the contraception mandate, any of these issues that, uh, death penalty, whatever it may, issues that are kind of on the agenda already, then people who start out agreeing with me think, oh boy, that was brilliant. <laughs> people who start out disagreeing with me think, completely missed the point. And it really seems to me that on these kinds of issues that people already have thought about and have already largely worked out an opinion on, we change very, very few minds. Uh, the one exception is where I, since I tend to be liberal, where I tend to take a more conservative position, then liberals will hear me out. They'll, they'll be willing to listen, um, but, um, but otherwise, I, I think uh, we tend to, um, uh, I don't think we tend to have nearly as much influence as people think. But where we do have some impact is essentially in the spotlight that we hold. And if we shine that on something that is not illuminated, 
we can indeed help project it onto the agenda. And sometimes some of those issues that we project on the agenda are so uncomfortable for the world that they force people to, and including policymakers, to take, to take action. Darfur is one example of that kind of thing. Um, human trafficking is another. Some kinds of global health issues uh, are another. And so increasingly I've been drawn to that. You, you can't do it all the time. You can't do it with every column. But if you can tell the story right, then sometimes by shining a light on something, you make people spill their coffee in the morning and in turn becomes the first step toward some kind of action to help resolve the, uh, the issue. I am indeed, um, if you've been following my columns, just back from uh, the Nuba Mountains in Sudan. Um, and since journalists are kind of always at their best telling war stories, <laughs> uh, let, me, uh, let me just tell you about a couple of uh, things that are kind of on my mind and, uh, and very much shaped by, um, by geography. And indeed, one is this uh, Sudan, which is a country that has been kind of fallen apart. It had already, of course, divided between North and South. The problem has classically been that Khartoum has marginalized all the areas, and that's one reason that, that Darfur rose up, the East rose up, the South rose up. And now in the Nuba Mountains, we have a real humanitarian crisis looming. Uh, you have tens of thousands of people who are going to face starvation in the coming months. The government has is trying to put down an insurrection there uh, by a rebel group, the SPLM North. And so it has surrounded the area. It is trying to, uh, it has kicked out all aid workers. It has tried to block food shipments from going in. Um, and it is bombing the area uh, daily. And the, the way Sudan bombs is they don't have real military targets. They have Antonovs, which are essentially cargo planes, and they push bombs out the back. And they fall and uh, they, um, you know, they rarely are their military casualties, usually at some civilian in a field. The real impact of those bombings is that people are afraid to cultivate their fields, so they don't have food, they don't have harvests, and, and they starve. And the upshot of this is going to be that in the coming months, maybe three months from now, we're going to face a situation where we do have real starvation in the Nuba Mountains, and there's going to be some kind of a, another debate about uh, humanitarian intervention in some form and what we do in that kind of situation. Do we have some non-consensual intervention such as creating a humanitarian corridor uh, into the Nuba Mountains? And um, I see my role in a sense <clears throat> as making those people who are being bombed, who are starving, making them real to the reader. That's why I also took a videographer with me so we can come up with images because it's an awful lot harder to turn a blind eye to somebody when you actually see their face. Um, Another example, which is rather less to do with human rights, but is uh, was just a really fun example for me. And I, as I was coming back from Sudan, I stopped over uh, in Greece. Uh, and um, one of the things that has always fascinated me is the, uh, is the question of uh, Homer and uh, Odysseus's, um, what, is, what his home was. And, uh, this is a good academic audience. What, what uh, Menelaus was from Sparta, um, Agamemnon from Mycenae, where was, uh, uh, where was Odysseus from? Ithaca, Ithaca right. And um, so there's been this search for what exactly was ancient Ithaca. And there's a modern island of Ithaca, but it doesn't match the description in Homer, although it, it insists that it is the real Ithaca. Um, and um, it, uh, Homer describes as the westernmost of the, of the Ionian Islands, and um, the westernmost of those is, is a big, huge island called Kefalonia, which doesn't match the description either. But a, uh, about 10 years ago, a um, British amateur who was a fan of Homer was looking at the maps, and, and he noted that um, if in this island of Kefalonia, if you take the westernmost peninsula of it, that that part of it actually really does match the Homeric description of Ithaca. And he went back and read an ancient uh, geographer called Strabo describing this area. And Strabo describes how this link to the rest of Kefalonia was uh, very low-lying and sometimes submerged. And he began to do research into the geology of the area and realized that it, it is um, forced up by the, the collision of two tectonic plates. 
And uh, so increasingly, classic scholars and archaeologists are taking very seriously the idea propounded by this, um, this British businessman, essentially, um, that uh, this part of Kefalonia, I'll call Paliki, was ancient Ithaca. And once you have that in mind, that all of a sudden it matches Homer amazingly well. And it was astonishing to go to this little harbor that fits perfectly to the description of where Odysseus returns and, and uh, so on. So stay tuned for a column on this um, <laughs> in the soon. Um, and another, I mean, wh one of the things that I think always troubles me is that Americans seem to have so little intuitive understanding of how the rest of the world sees us. And as a result, I think we make profound policy mistakes. Um, and uh, one of the things that I worry about most this year in terms of things that could go badly wrong, for example, is a strike on Iranian nuclear uh, sites. And I think we have to think about how we can deepen this kind of, uh, of, of understanding in the U.S. to inform policymaking. And I have a couple of, of um, suggestions or requests for you, roles in which I think the academic world and perhaps geographers in particular can, can play a role. The first is that I think universities need to do a much better job of sending young people uh, abroad, not just on, you know, in herds to London or Rome. I mean, that's, that's nice too, but really embedding them for a time, ideally outside of their, of their, their culture zone. And um, in particular, I think that the tradition in Europe of taking a gap year before college is a brilliant idea. I, I took a gap year uh, and spent part of that working in France um, on, a, on a farm and packing peaches and I turned out to be the world's worst peach picker and peach packer, <laughs> but I learned a lot about, um, uh, about it. And I think that um, likewise, if from the university's point of view, if students kind of spent that year and you know, if, if they, it's very cheap, it's much cheaper to learn a language abroad than it is to learn a language in a classroom at an American university. You can teach English part-time and in many places to subsidize your existence. You bring an extra richness to the classroom. And you know, my vision is that universities would in their acceptance letters say, congratulations, we look forward to having you, but think about postponing a year and, um, uh, and, and taking that gap year. And it's becoming a little more common in kind of elite universities, but it still, I think, needs to be encouraged um, much, much more, and I, I, I hope we can do that. I, um, I, I should say that my enthusiasm for this, essentially, when I talk about getting out of the comfort zone, my own experience with this partly had to do with when I was a, a student and uh, moved to Egypt for a year to study Arabic, and I will never forget my first uh, uh, wretched attempt to have a conversation in Arabic. Um, anybody here speak Arabic? Uh, uh, well, Shwaya, then you may not you may not know this this uh, expression. The um, um, uh, somebody uh, said to me, he said Ismak eh, which I recognize means what's your name. And I was so pleased. I'm about to have my first Arabic conversation, and so I said Ismi, my name is. And I thought Nicholas Kristoff is way too complicated, so I said Ismi Nick. This person looked at me in horror. <laughs> Stepped back a little, but asked in this querulous voice said. You know, something had clearly gone very profoundly wrong. I had no idea what. Uh, but sort of following the, the classic American logic that anybody can understand English if it's spoken loudly enough. <laughs> so I just beamed and stepped toward him and repeated and said, it's me, Nick. Well, he ran away. <laughs> and it, who would have known that in, in Arabic, uh, Nick... Uh, how do I put this? It, essentially, it's the F word. <laughs> and <laughs> to make matters worse is, is the conjugation. <laughs> um, it's, the, um, it's, the, um, it's the equivalent of the two form. Uh, so you're being not only vulgar, but also condescending. Um, <laughs> and to be precise, it's, it's a familiar imperative. Uh, <laughs> so 
my whole time in Egypt after that, as you can imagine, was <laughs> kind of difficult. And American friends would see me and yell, hey, Nick. <laughs> we wonder why we have problems in the Arab world, you know? Um, but essentially, that's what I really wish, that sense of just being in over your head, of not knowing what's going on, of, of just wanting to head to the airport. That's exactly what I wish on more American kids today. Um, and I think that if, if there were more people who had that kind of experience, they would in turn come back and be constituents for um, more nuanced, complex policies uh, uh, today. Um, and the other suggestion or request I have for you um, has to do with the voice that uh, academics have on public policy issues. It seems to me that one thing very unfortunate that has happened over about the last half century is that academic experts have uh, to some extent been marginalized from major policy debates, especially on international relations. And I think there are a number of reasons for that, and uh, part of it is the rise of the think tanks. I mean, you know, in, indeed, when I'm looking for an expert to, to sort of a dial a quote, I'm more likely to go to a, a, a think tank uh, than I am to uh, an academic expert. And part of it may be the decline of regional studies. Um, but I also, you know, think that academics have to some degree marginalized themselves from these kinds of debates. And part of it is uh, some fields, including political science, becoming kind of moving up to 30,000 feet, becoming very theoretical, very abstract, and moving away from really wrestling with some of the key issues that the world faces. Um, part of it is that academic writing has likewise become more abstruse and often more popular writing is regarded with some suspicion. Um, academics are not very present in social media for the most part uh, as experts weighing in. You have some, you have some exceptions uh, on Twitter or Facebook or, or the blogs, but there, there's this extraordinary collection of expertise on the world, on human rights issues, on these things that for the most part isn't tapped and isn't brought to bear on these issues. And indeed, I think much of the blame lies outside academia, but I think a considerable part of it also rests with academia not trying hard enough to wrestle with key policy issues and to weigh in on them. And uh, my hope is that we can all try harder to, to remedy that. Thanks very much, and I'm looking forward to the panel. Thank you. It's a very cruel twist of fate that puts me between Nicholas Kristof and Salil Shetty, but I'm Australian and I will soldier on. Uh, my name is Jessica Windham and I'm the Associate Program Director of the Scientific Responsibility, Human Rights and Law Program at the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Our program has worked with Amnesty International for over five years in bringing geospatial technologies and geospatial analysis to human rights work. Uh, we've done that from 30,000 feet up uh, when it's either impossible, too dangerous, or unreliable to do that kind of human rights uh, monitoring and documentation. In comparison, one thing that's so compelling about Salil Shetty's uh, leadership as Secretary General of Amnesty International is that he's trained his focus on people on the ground and galvanizing the 2.8 million members of Amnesty International to do what he says, which is to speak truth to justice. <clears throat> Grassroots activism and the strength of individuals to address abuses of power was something with which he grew up as the son of a journalist and the son of a women's rights activist in the 1970s during the tumultuous period uh, in India. It was during that time that he was head of the student union in Bangalore and his personal and professional journey has taken him on to be the, uh, the chief executive of Action Aid between 1998 and 2003, and then director of the UN uh, uh, Millennium Campaign uh, between 2003 and 2010. 
He took up the role of Secretary General of Amnesty International in July of 2010, and part of the focus of his work has been on energizing, strengthening, and building the, uh, the base, truly internationalizing Amnesty International with a focus on building the membership uh, in the developing world. And to give you some of his bona fides, Shetty holds a Master's of Science in Social Policy and Planning from the London <coughs> School of Economics and a Master's in Bus Business Administration from the India Institute of Management in Ahmedabad. So with that, I'll introduce you to Salil Shetty. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jessica. That's always the most embarrassing part of the of the proceedings. Uh, I, I'm hoping I get to a point like Nick Christoph where no introduction is needed. <laughs> it's gonna take a while though. Uh, but thank you to the association for, for inviting uh, Amnesty to speak here. Um, I, I'm speaking with some nervousness because uh, to, to speak to a group of geographers about uh, use of satellite technology and, and all of these things uh, is very risky because many people in the audience know a lot more about this than me, but of course we are looking at it very much from a human rights lens. Now, uh, I wanted to locate this uh, discussion in the broader context. I, I think certainly our view is that there are two um, opposing but uh, coexisting trends in the world today. On the one hand, uh, with globalization and with the growth in digital technology, uh, this combination really is making the world more and more sort of border busting. Um, and we have trade and investment agreements uh, which are pushed through by with the support of powerful Western governments, international financial institutions, um, and corporations, which uh, at the risk of saying this to a bunch of geographers, I'm sure you've heard of the term uh, end of geography, and not geographers, uh, but certainly a sort of a Fukuyama twist in, in geography has been talked about. But equally, I think uh, at the same time, uh, while on the one hand we have this push towards uh, creating borderless uh, realities. Um, and, and there's some very awkward facts in this regard. Um, you may be aware that one of the things which has happened in the last decade alone is that uh, this free flow of uh, capital and free flow of goods and trade has resulted in very significant capital flight as well. Approximately $850 billion of money from developing countries annually moves towards rich countries, which are also tax havens quite often, which is 10 times the money uh, equal to the total amount of aid, development aid that flows. So all of this has happened, and, and very extreme cases of uh, what we would call extrajudicial executions, like the use of drones, which do not allow for borders to be respected anymore. Uh, so that's on the one hand. Now, on the other hand, of course, given the the very serious concerns around security and the so-called war on terror, and equally the economic crisis. What we are seeing increasingly is that you know, countries are pulling their shutters down, borders are becoming more and more important, and what we are seeing is a massive push against immigration, a sort of anti-immigration hysteria and uh, xenophobic tendencies in many, many countries, uh, particularly in Europe, but I think we can see signs of that here as well. So, um, and I think, Christoph's uh, writings on Sudan will also remind you of you know, how borders are so, are so important. So we have both realities happening at the same time. Now, of course, overall, if you were to ask us uh, our experiences that the growth of technology, digital communications, satellites, etc., has been very, very important uh, in terms of promoting the cause of human rights. Um, I think the, you know, the, most, uh, the, the fact that we've had mainstream and social media playing such a key role in last year's, or the, the revolutions we've seen across the world in the last year. And it's not just the Middle East and North Africa, of course, those have, are the most visible ones, but really what we've seen from Bolivia to Cuba to Azerbaijan to Russia to China has been massively aided by technology. Uh, there's no question about that. Uh, and this is a combination of things, of course. On the one hand, it's a straight flow of information, but solidarity, I mean, we've seen the Los Indignados in Madrid, uh, you know, showing solidarity with the people in Tahrir Square. And we have, of course, the ability to protest uh, and organize people around protests has been quite incredible. Um, and one very crucial part of all this has been the ability to do this in an anonymous way, particularly in countries where there is no uh, freedom of expression, freedom of uh, association. 
But in very practical terms, when Mubarak's uh, thugs were uh, attacking the protesters in Tahrir Square, we saw that the world could actually watch this happening on satellite TV. Uh, when Gaddafi's forces, uh, or Gaddafi himself took, uh, the, uh, took to the airwaves to denounce his opponents and swore that he's going to wipe out the rats, the Security Council took notice and uh, this was whole, the whole issue was referred to the International Criminal Court. So there's many sort of you know, positive things which we can and, and we should recognize as we speak. Uh, I think Jessica and, and certainly I think uh, Doug has already mentioned some of the practical examples of how we have been, in fact, we're very grateful to many of you and the AAAS and AAG for working with us on many of these examples which I wanted to share, some of which uh, Doug has already touched on. But I, I was going to talk about three or four examples and then I'm sure it will come up during the discussions. I think the one very practical thing, a use that we have put it to so far, the use of handheld GPS, for example, um, is in the area of uh, forced evictions. Uh, the forced evictions are an increasing problem, both in urban areas because, um, for example, in, in Rio, with the oncoming World Cup and Olympics, we're already seeing all the signs of this happening. And of course, in, in rural areas, due to the extractive industries, uh, minerals, um, and the sort of uh, forced displacement of people. So you have this both in rural and urban areas. And what we've been able to do is to really use satellite technology handheld um, devices to uh, really uh, identify those communities who are at risk and also identify you know, overnight you find entire communities and houses disappearing and we could really we can really document it using this and i think that's one very concrete example on hyperspectral imaging from aircrafts and satellites um, the mass grave example was already mentioned here i think the the important thing that you know which i wanted to highlight there is the combination of the technology but then the forensic experts can excavate and examine the remains, uh, and, and we can then, from a human rights perspective, call on domestic and international courts to build up legal cases. And this has already happened in Cambodia and elsewhere. Uh, otherwise, the graves remain undiscovered for, uh, for years, if not decades. Um, and even local communities who know that the mass graves are there are often very nervous to bring this up because of any risk of uh, retribution from the state. The other example was, uh, is about uh, signal satellite technology. And here, it's really to use uh, uh, tracking uh, methods to particularly track ships who are carrying uh, military supplies uh, to uh, even under circumstances where these, these are supposed to be an embargo. And uh, we, of course, it's tricky because you have to then compare this with end use certificates. And there's a lot of fiddling which happens there. But we have managed to do that in a few places to pin accountability. The most recent example, of course, which we are all most concerned about is Syria with the Russian uh, ships landing in, in Tartus, uh, which, which is happening as we speak. As you know, we have crimes against humanity being committed uh, as we speak in Syria. But um, Russia is really promoting its business interests and its armed supply commitments to prevent any change in the Security Council's position. Another example is handheld devices distributed to local partners in the Niger Delta, for example. This has allowed us to track oil spills and uh, challenge Shell, uh, the oil company in the Niger Delta. And Shell uh, have historically been claiming that 90% of all of the oil spills are happening due to just sabotage. And uh, we've been able to show, and uh, some of the recent reports we've done have been also confirmed uh, by UNIT, uh, independently, the United Nations Environment Program. So that's been a very powerful use, and uh, Jessica knows a lot more about many of these examples uh, technically than I do. Uh, last year alone, we were able to use satellite images and match that with the testimonies from refugees to reveal the location of North Korean uh, prison camps. And here, more than 200,000 people have been involved in these, have been uh, imprisoned under pretty awful conditions. So it's not just the location, not just the size, but also the conditions of the prisons. And the important thing here is, again, the combination of the use of technology with research that we carried out with, from refugees who managed to come out. And North Korea, as many of you know, was uh, s consistently denying the existence of these uh, prison camps until we could find some hard evidence to show this. Uh, the Eyes On project, we have been running these Eyes On projects. Uh, with, we started with uh, Eyes On Darfur, 
uh, with the Janjaweed at the, at the, at the time. Uh, this is a few years ago. But more recently, we've been running an Eyes on Syria project, again, to show the devastation on civilian uh, homes uh, in, in many of the parts. And we were able to use this with the UN Security Council to make a presentation to show them the hard evidence in this regard. Now, uh, before I close, I did want to say that uh, you know the, the, it, it's obviously true that technology is uh, value neutral only until it is used. Now, depending on how you use it, uh, of course, it could go either way. Uh, there's been a lot of celebration about the use of social media and technology in Egypt. Uh, Nick mentioned Egypt. Uh, but I, I was in uh, Suez a few months ago and I met with the mothers of the first two martyrs who gave their lives in Egypt. The, the, Suez was the place where the, some of the most bloody and initial battles happened. And uh, we, we spent an hour with the mothers who lost their children, who are still waiting for justice, by the way. Um, and of course, you know, that conversation was not about Facebook or Twitter. You know, the, I always say that those who put their bodies in front of the tanks and Thirty Square, uh, we're not tweeting. I mean, the, you can't really, there's no substitute uh, for the human courage, which is really at the heart of what we're seeing in Syria and Egypt. Uh, but at the same time, uh, and, the, and the other side of it, of course, is that uh, still using the Egypt uh, story is that um, we had a very tough meeting with the Supreme Council of Armed Forces when I was there. One of the things that the SCAF or the military generals who are running the country are, have been doing, and they're doing a whole lot of very bad things, but one thing they've been doing is use uh, military trials. And in the last uh, one year, I think they've put more than 12,000 people through military trials, which is more than what Mubarak did in the entire 30-year period when he was ruling. Um, and so uh, when I was saying to the general that, you know, this is uh, unacceptable, it's not, you know, it's violating international human rights. No, oh, and so he said, oh, it's fine, you know, if you have a complaint, can you just write it on our Facebook page? So <laughs> it kind of just struck me that <laughs> the way in which these can be used, there are much more sophisticated uh, ways in which governments are also using it to repress uh, uh, protest and human rights in China and Iran, uh, in my own country, India, as you know, they're trying to get uh, Google and Facebook to take down, take down content. So people are getting, governments are getting much smarter. Both governments and corporations would, of course, like to use the power of technology to subordinate people and to subordinate um, human rights, to abuse authority and to put profits over people. Uh, but with your help, I think, and that's really the most important thing, we can uh, use technology to promote human rights, protect the rights of people. Um, in any case, I think one of the most positive, I think, lessons or hopes from the last one year is that it's very clear that uh, human beings, people across the world, are not going to just accept this anymore, you know, and that uh, there's no way in which you can stop the human quest for knowledge, for freedom, and justice. So I wanted to thank you for your support, and I hope that we can continue to work uh, closely together. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. It is a, a distinct honor now to introduce, sorry, um, Ivan Shimonovich, who is the Assistant Secretary General for Human Rights of the United Nations. Ivan Shimonovich is a law professor by training. He has had a long career in addressing human rights uh, in various parts of the world. He was one of the peace negotiators for the former Yugoslavia. He was Minister of Justice and Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs for Croatia and the permanent representative of Croatia at the United Nations uh, for six years before taking on um, his present, whoops, okay, his present post as um, Assistant Secretary General for Human Rights. Uh, Nick, and I'm using it in English, not Arabic <laughs> sense. Uh, Nick uh, was uh, not too demanding when addressing you. He said, well, it would be nice for you to encourage kids to travel. It would be nice uh, to write uh, explicitly on the issues uh, that you are concerned. But I will be more demanding. I will be more demanding because when being with geographers, I feel being with friends. It's a positive selection among geographers 
because you are persons who are interested to find something new. You are not ethnocentric. You are interested in other uh, countries, other cultures, uh, and uh, most likely people who are tolerant to diversity and interested in uh, other parts of the world and its inhabitants. So uh, I was uh, very carefully uh, listening uh, to Executive Director Richardson and looking at the pictures he was showing uh, and afterwards uh, listening to Salil and the use of satellite imagery. And I had a flashback. Uh, it was all of a sudden 1992. I was talking uh, to uh, women whose uh, husbands were detained. And one of them told me, please help me to get him out of the prison. He was in prison combatant, uh, because otherwise he won't live very long. He is a witness uh, to a large crimes against humanity, uh, and he just had luck to escape execution. Uh, can you do something about it? Well, there was little we can do. We had no witnesses except that one, and he was arrested as a prisoner of war. But uh, the chance we had was satellite imagery of the mass grave, and he escaped the execution. So uh, to the best of my knowledge, in 1992, early 1992, it was the first time that satellite imagery was used to identify a mass grave at Ofchara. Afterwards, we were cases, we had cases, and you demonstrated some of them in Bosnia and Herzegovina, in Kosovo, and elsewhere. Uh, my own Office of Human Rights uh, has, been, uh, uh, has been offering secretariat uh, services to a panel of inquiry on Sri Lanka. And uh, really, panel relied a lot on satellite images in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, trying to establish whereabouts of uh, uh, tens of thousands persons who have uh, been killed by uh, the end uh, of the war. Uh, the same applies to uh, Syria that uh, has been mentioned. Commission of Inquiry uh, on Syria in its report is using arguments that were uh, obtained through uh, satellite as well as, uh, 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 as well as evidence based on something else that has been uh, uh, mentioned and it's uh, uh, the use of social networks and electronic media. So they were not using that as direct evidence, but based on uh, those evidence uh, uh, that was available uh, through social networks, they were able uh, to contact witnesses and to then have proper witnesses uh, of some developments. Uh, from the outset, UN was dependent on member states to provide them satellite images and it sometimes worked and sometimes didn't work, pending of interests of uh, the respecting states that had access to satellite technology. So in 2003, we have in the United Nations established UNOSAT, which is satellite application that we now routinely use. And to the best of my knowledge, it was used from 2003 until 9 on more than 200 occasions. And uh, it really serves very different purposes. Some of them uh, were mentioned by Mr. Richardson and Salil, uh, but there are others as well. They, use, uh, they, they can be used for prevention as well. So you can see that there are some large movements. You can use that to warn uh, the population that might be put into danger by certain movements of troops. You can, uh, you can identify movements of refugees and displaced persons and then ensure that they have uh, uh, access to food, water, sanitation, uh, etc. Just as well, uh, your 
professional knowledge is highly important for some other aspects which are not related to immediate crisis, but some sort of long-term problems uh, from global warming and uh, the effects of global warming uh, to nature, uh, as well as to shrinking agricultural land, which is cause of conflict in a number of Sahel countries as well as Somalia and elsewhere, including Sudan. Uh, so, uh, to put it short, uh, human rights need your brains as well as your hearts. And I am uh, looking forward uh, to your continued support to human rights. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to say that, contrary to many sessions, there is some time for discussion and questions from the floor. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Chris Kassel from Amnesty International. Um, I have a quick question uh, concerning the latest point remarks. Uh, you were mentioning that the creation of the Syria support period precedes the Latin inquiry, or Yes, uh, uh, they were collecting images from all available sources. And I think that's the way that should be done. And in fact, uh, 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 only satellite imagery uh, was not for them reaching the threshold uh, uh, of evidence. But it was very useful uh, to uh, uh, then uh, check that through other uh, evidentiary sources. Uh, uh, either it's witnesses or it's victims or some written materials. So all that put together is becoming very powerful evidence which has led to conclusion that uh, crimes against humanity have been committed in Syria. Because through all these sources, you can document that violations of uh, uh, humanitarian law were widespread were systematic and which in uh, this report which is going to be uh, uh, presented to the Human Rights Council on 12 and is already being discussed today because there is an urgent debate uh, on a uh, situation in Syria before the Human Rights Council. Uh, it is able also to identify responsibility. Responsibility by top level military and top uh, level uh, government officials. Uh, so it's not only uh, documentation of crimes committed, but goes a step further. It speaks about responsibility. Um, one, two, three. <laughs> You're first. Yeah, I really want to thank you about uh, this uh, program. And I Maybe we can take one of these. And, uh, could, could we have someone who could? Uh, could we have someone who could maybe carry the mic around the room? I can carry that. Thank can you. Um, you want to get yeah, finish your question, then I'll grab it. All right. I just wanted to hear about uh, your action about um, human rights violation in Iran, and stoning. What you have done, and what is uh, your plan? question was addressed to uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I mean, Iran, as you know, is a case, uh, is a country on which Amnesty has been working for a long time, and there's, uh, it, 
it's been a matter of much greater concern in the last few years post elections where there's been a serious increase in repression of freedom of expression association now in the case of uh, uh, the stoning issue. I mean, our concern has been, it's, it's, there are multiple issues here. There's a kind of a women's rights issue, which I think is a, is a deep concern. Um, for also, there's an issue about, you know, any kind of, uh, e effectively, death of any kind, you know, but through any method. I mean, the issue really is about stoning in this case. But as far as we are concerned, uh, it was unacceptable uh, under any grounds. Um, and the campaigns we're running on Iran are manifold. I think you're asking specifically about what actions we're taking. Um, I think the, the way in which Amnesty works, maybe I should just briefly explain that to you because Nick uh, and I think Jessica rather mentioned briefly about the membership base of Amnesty. So we have um, over three million members across the world. So one very concrete way in which the campaigns are carried out is that our members across the world um, run campaigns in their own context. So if there are Iranian sort of embassies in their country or if there are urgent action appeals, so in the case of, uh, in, the, in the specific case of the stoning issue, for example, we took that up as an urgent action case. So we will be writing letters, emails, faxes uh, to all the authorities in Iran and anybody who has an influence on Iran. Uh, success, of course, in the case of Iran is uh, much less than what we would like to see. Uh, but it's an ongoing uh, case, and you know, this, that's only one case. There are many, many cases in Iran that we are fighting about. Um, as you know, I mean, journalists, artists, uh, it's just innumerable cases. And, uh, and it's a matter of uh, growing concern. I think we feel that one, Iran is one of those cases now, because of what's happening in the Middle East and North Africa, uh, our worry is that Iran has somehow slipped out of the sort of uh, gaze right now. And uh, of course, it's sort of coming back in the context of what's happening in Syria, because the Iranian regime is very actively supporting the Assad regime for, you know, for their own reasons. Uh, but I think certainly in Amnesty's uh, campaigning field, uh, Iran always figures very high on the list. Cynthia? Um, thank you all very much. This was a very um, valuable way to spend a Tuesday morning. Um, and my question is for, for Nicholas Kristof, um, and it has a little bit to do with your talking about geographers tending to theorize a bit too much. And one of the debates is often whether we're going to, one of the decisions is are we going to do qualitative or quantitative research. And I would like to address that in um, relation to an interview I heard with you and Krista Tippett, where you talked about um, one, a story about one person or one face moves people to action, but two or three or 10 or 10,000 stops us from acting. Would you mind addressing that for a minute? Sure. <clears throat> um, essentially, my interest in this arose after uh, Darfur, because I'd be making these trips to Darfur, and I'd see these horrendous things going on and write these columns, and it felt as if they were just disappearing without a, a ripple in the pond. Meanwhile, at the very same time, in New York City, in Central Park, there were two hawks. The male was the pale male and his mate. You may remember these hawks. They had been pushed out of their nest in a condo just on the edge of the park. And New Yorkers were all up in arms about these two homeless hawks. And I couldn't understand why I couldn't generate the same amount of outrage over people being slaughtered and driven out of their villages in Darfur as people felt for these hawks. And that led me to poke around in the literature in um, neurology, but especially in social psychology. And it really turns out that in terms of how you generate, how you drive people to show compassion, to have empathy, it seems largely about two things. And there's been an amazing amount of research in this over the last 20 years or so. And one factor is um, individual stories, that an individual case will open up that channel um, and uh, while we just get numbed by large numbers and tune out. And we all sort of know intuitive, intuitively that you know, one, one death is a tragedy, a million is, is, a, is a statistic. But the, these researchers um, have, been, have kind of looked at the point at which we began to tune out. And you know what the number is, the, how, uh, the size of the class of victims when we begin to tune out? It's when the class of victims reaches two. Um, the, uh, the moment you go from just one person to two, then interest diminishes and, you know, keeps on diminishing. Um, and the other factor that is relevant is that people want the sense that 
they can make a difference. So there, if something feels just terrible and hopeless and tragic, but but sad, but kind of impervious to change, then again, they, they're not so interested, they don't want to act. What, um, so the, the trick seems to be to focus on individual stories and to show that with some intervention, one can change the trajectory. And um, so um, <laughs> if, you, if you look at my columns since that period, then I have very often tried to put that into place. In our book, Half the Sky, tried to do, you know, we look for an individual poster child of the phenomenon and to show that there, there can be uh, change, that it's not hopeless. Um, and one of the things that I think is sort of unfortunate, and I say this sort of as a journalist, that, you know, every, that an amazing amount of marketing goes into products that don't make a difference to the world. You know, every, every day I get incredibly professional pitches from companies that have these teams of marketers that are doing focus groups and everything else. Meanwhile, on causes that truly matter to the world, whether it's global health, human rights, whatever, those organizations don't have the resources. And sometimes there's even a sense of squeamishness about the idea of marketing. You know, this, there's nothing that matters more than figuring out how to market um, whatever, the crisis in Syria, in the Nuba Mountains, malaria, AIDS, whatever else. And I think it's important that the humanitarian world acknowledge that, you know, it's not, it's not just about the problem, but it's also about trying to figure out how to connect to people to galvanize them to act. Uh, I'll start, this is for Ivan. I don't mean to be familiar, but I won't try your last name there. But uh, <laughs> on the issue of human rights, uh, are you looking at uh, kind of the off the balance sheet impact of financial fraud and the financial crisis that on the ground is driving these events, where a lot of the austerity programs, and Nick, when you mentioned Greece, I thought you were gonna talk perhaps about the, the problems there. But, uh, you know, where we're in currency war situation, economic war, that create these other problems on the ground, so you're, you're kind of, uh, uh, is human rights looking to economic rights, financial rights? Thank you for this question. Uh, for us, human rights are indivisible, uh, civil and political as well as economic and social rights. So we are very much interested in uh, the effects of financial crisis on livelihood of uh, human beings, uh, be it in developing or developed countries. Uh, we have established through our special rapporteurs that in developed countries, in a number of them, there are impoverished people whose uh, human rights have been very much endangered, especially vulnerable groups, elderly, disabled, and so on. So we do try uh, to, influence, uh, to, uh, to influence government to, in these uh, difficult uh, uh, moments, establish some sort of safety net, especially for vulnerable groups. On the other hand, of course, that uh, matter of our utmost concern is uh, the issue of development and uh, human rights. And in this respect, uh, it is true uh, that uh, uh, in contemporary world, we do not have sufficiently effective institutions uh, dealing with economic and social crisis. On one hand, we have some groupings, G8, G20. On the other hand, we have uh, International Monetary Fund and World Bank, which are applying strict uh, uh, Milson Friedman liberal economic criteria. On the other hand, in the United Nations, you have UNDP, who is uh, very much, uh, uh, I would say, from economic point of view, Keynesian-oriented organization which uh, tries to ensure that uh, 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 employment uh, results, uh, uh, that em employment is in the function of economic recovery and should 
uh, start uh, uh, the economic, uh, economic uh, wheel uh, to function again. Uh, in 2002, I was president of Economic and Social Council of the United Nations, one of the main organs. It sounds magnificent. Uh, from the point of protocol, you are third person in the UN hierarchy. In reality, you are frustrated and you, you cannot do a thing. You are completely impotent. So I, I certainly do believe that economic and social area, we will have to have uh, major organizational improvements. We have become so much interdependent, it's so visible that crisis spills over, and we have not established adequate instruments. So this is something in front of all of us. Okay. Just quickly supplement, I mean, because I would say, generally speaking, and, uh, and my colleague Whitney is here, who's been thinking a lot about this question as well, that I think the area of economic social rights are less developed in the human rights arena. I think a lot more, as I think uh, Ivan is suggesting, we have more work to do. But in relation to the current crisis, I think uh, you know, the core issue, uh, human rights issue, is one of accountability here. Because the problem we are facing is that uh, you know, the, the crisis has been caused by one set of people and the consequences are being faced by another set of people. And the people who are facing the consequences are amongst the most vulnerable. Um, and so the discrimination that already these people are facing in the first instance, being poor, being, say, African-American woman in this country, all of those, you know, they get multiplied manifold. So in many countries, it's immigrants, it's uh, those who are already vulnerable. Uh, who are getting uh, further attacked as a result of the crisis. Now, to compound that, I think the, the solutions which are being uh, prescribed uh, in order to address the crisis are going to make matters worse because it means that there's going to be further cutbacks in uh, social expenditure, et cetera, on, on which these very people depend for uh, survival. So I think there are, there are many sort of human rights questions related to this. and. You know, we, we talk about right to adequate housing as a right, and with the numbers of foreclosures and people being pushed out of houses and the impact that has on water, on sanitation, on housing itself, um, I think they're quite serious. But I would say you're right to point out that human rights as a, as a discipline or a, or a sort of a community uh, need to think harder about how we can make meaningful intervention in, these, in this discourse. Sorry, could I just add one reference for the US? Uh, you can look at the economist Radhika Balakrishnan, who has been analyzing the economic crisis in the US using a human rights framework and working also with her colleague, colleague James Heinz. They're at Rutgers University. And also the National Center for Law, Homelessness, and Poverty is looking at the issue of homelessness arising due to foreclosures using a human rights framework. There are a few hands up. I have two, and that may be all that we have time for, but we'll do our best. Okay, it's my, is it my turn? Yes. Thanks. I want to uh, return this uh, panel to the more basic uh, uh, issue of human rights where uh, you do that certainly have tools. Uh, I'm Oren Iftahel from Israel, and I'm the chairman of uh, B'Tselem, the human rights organization that uh, works with Palestinians. And um, the question of the very, very basic right for self-determination, which of course is a collective right, hasn't been uh, raised here enough. And our work on the ground, while we deal a lot with uh, individual human rights, uh, there is an overall goal to fulfill what is enshrined in all the convention, the uh, uh, right for self-determination. And it's been very frustrating. And I want perhaps whether the panel can comment uh, with uh, very uh, major uh, documents like the Goldstone Report, or like the ICJ decision on the wall, like, of course, the fact that Israel uh, uh, was created by UN uh, decisions and nothing of that spilled over to the Palestinians. When will uh, the instruments that exist be applied for uh, uh, self-determination right for the Palestinians, and especially with the uh, New York Times influence and with uh, uh, UN uh, that perhaps uh, can think about bypassing the veto rights that exist in the Security Council that has been so uh, put us on into paralysis. And of course, this at the end is the cause also for individual abuse of human rights. So your comment on that, please. Um, 
I tend to think that on issues of national security, then governments <clears throat> tend to take, a, take the initiative, take the lead. On issues of human rights, I think governments don't, and really public opinion is not all that matters, but almost all that matters. And so I don't think, frankly, that ICJ opinions or other um, uh, kind of macro or legal interpretations really matter very much in shaping those views. What I do think matters a great deal is something that Batellum, the organization, I mean, has in fact done, which is, for example, handing out video cameras. Um, I think that that, uh, I mean, there, there's always been this, um, this sense in the West Bank that, you know, different people have different narratives, and so, um, and everybody feels their own narrative is absolutely right, and you have um, disputed versions, and after B'Tselem began handing out those video cameras to Palestinian families in Hebron, and all of a sudden they began coming up with these videos showing settlers carrying clubs and attacking Palestinian kids, that really did, I think, shake people up here and change the narrative and, and have a real impact. And I think that uh, it's, you know, those individual stories and those individual uh, photos or videos that really have a profound effect on on public opinion in that sense. Um, and um, I mean, I you know, when I write about uh, Israel or the West Bank, that's a classic example where I feel that I don't change anybody's mind. That uh, people who start out agreeing think, uh, yes, exactly right. Those who disagree are not persuaded one iota. I do think photos, videos, they, they can have some impact over time, a cumulative impact over time. In uh, explaining UN position, uh, first let me clarify what is UN. Uh, is it member states or is it the organization and secretariat? Now, as far as uh, Secretariat is concerned, Secretary General, uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights, have a very clear view on uh, a Palestinian right to self-determination and their right to a state, as well as for uh, their human rights. As far as member states are concerned, there has been a number of resolutions passed by General Assembly and Human Rights Council in this regard. However, uh, the uh, resolutions of uh, both uh, Human Rights Council and uh, General Assembly are not legally binding. They are politically binding for member states because it's majority of the world that thinks that way, but they don't become politically binding. The only, uh, the only legally binding decisions are the decisions uh, of the Security Council, and uh, this is uh, the answer to your questions. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry, uh, the mic has been passed along in order, but we are out of time and I am going to stop it at that point. Uh, I've heard four things, if I can say them very briefly, bear witness, communicate, educate, and do something. I'd like to thank all of our panelists uh, most deeply for uh, the way that they have done all of those four things. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>